couple of weeks ago, I was out running errands when I bumped into one of our members, John Adams, decorating the Christmas tree at the old Ashland feed store. John seemed a little embarrassed by it since it wasn't even Thanksgiving yet. He's been to seminary. He knows that Thanksgiving comes before Christmas. And yet he explained that the parade was coming through town that weekend. It was going to pass right in front of the old Ashland feed store. And if he didn't have the Christmas tree up with the lights on, somebody in that town might think he didn't have the Christmas spirit. And you wouldn't want that to happen. I can understand that feeling. Here we are with Thanksgiving leftovers still in the fridge, talking about the coming of Christ at Christmas. This is the first Sunday of Advent. We begin on this day to wait and prepare for the one who is to come. It feels a little funny. But maybe I should remind you, and especially those of you who are out shopping on Black Friday, that Advent is not the same as Christmas. No matter how many Christmas carols you heard in the store, this is a season of waiting for the coming of Christ, a time of getting ready to receive the newborn king. And just like when we were children, it's hard for us to wait. Someone will probably ask me after the service today why we didn't sing Joy to the World, the Lord is Come. That's one of my favorites, they'll say. I love that song. And I'll say, well, I love that song too, but it says, Joy to the World, the Lord is Come, and if we're going to do it by the book, we should probably wait until He comes before we start singing songs about it. And they'll be disappointed. But there is something about this season that is magical in its own way. We wait for the coming of Christ. We light the candles and count down the days. We anticipate the miracle that is on its way. When I was a boy, the waiting for Christmas was in some ways even better than Christmas itself. Because right up until the moment I opened my grandmother's package and found that it contained a pair of socks, I believed that it could contain almost anything. A new pocket knife, baseball glove, a pony, who knew? So in the weeks before Christmas, I would look at those packages under the tree and I would pick them up and shake them to see if I could guess what was inside. And by Christmas Eve, I was so excited I could hardly sleep. And my parents had told us not to wake them up before six o'clock but I would often wake up well before that, three, four o'clock in the morning. I would drag my mattress over to the top of the steps so I could lie there and look at the clock on the dining room wall, watching the hands move. Sometimes it seemed as if they had gotten stuck. But with every passing minute, I knew I was one minute closer to that moment when I could run down the steps and shout, Christmas is here! I loved that season, that sense of anticipation. The waiting itself was wonderful. That's what we try to do in Advent. We try to wait for the coming of Christ. We try to focus our waiting on Him. And let me remind you that as Christians, we are not only commemorating that first coming 2,000 years ago, but also anticipating His second coming which is still ahead of us. So we're not just pretending to wait. This is real. In this season, we seek to get ourselves and our souls ready as if Christ were coming back tomorrow because who knows? He might. This year we have chosen as our Advent theme the Word made flesh from that well-known passage in John's Gospel. In the beginning was the Word the Word was with God and the Word was God. The Word became flesh and dwelt among us. It is that miracle, the miracle of incarnation that we celebrate at Christmas. But in these Sundays leading up to Christmas, we light the candles of hope and peace and joy and love. 
And in this Advent season, I'd like to consider how each of those words has become flesh in the person of Jesus, beginning with the word hope. But let me ask you this. How do you preach an entire sermon on one word? That's what I was wondering last week. I thought you could begin by looking it up in the dictionary, and even though it seems obvious, I I did it. This is what I found out. Hope is the feeling that what is wanted can be had, or that events will turn out for the best. You could look it up in a Bible dictionary. I did that too, where I learned that the word hope is mentioned 15 times in the Old Testament book of Job. Can you believe it? In the New Testament, it is often lifted up as the essence of Christianity. It's what causes us to look forward to our everlasting life, and according to Paul, it, along with faith and love, are those three things that endure. You could look the word up in a dictionary of quotations just to see what other people have said about it through the years. And if you did, and of course I did, I found that Emily Dickinson said, hope is the thing with feathers that perches in the soul and sings the song without the words and never stops at all. Cicero once proclaimed, doom spiro spero, which means something like, as long as I have breath in my body, I will hope. And one of my favorites from the Roman poet Ovid, who said, let your hook be always cast. In the pool where you least expect it will be fish. Good word for fishermen. You could do a Google search just to see what the World Wide Web had to say about a word like hope. I did. And I found out that among other things, Hope is a college in Michigan. It's a town in Arkansas. It's a cable television channel sponsored by the Seventh-day Adventist. And it's a conference for computer geeks called Hackers on Planet Earth. (laughs) Hope. But as I continued my search, I found that the word hope was showing up in some unlikely places. Cancer wards, rehab clinics, third world countries. In fact, the longer I searched, the more I found this word associated with those places and situations where you would least expect it. Or maybe that's the thing about hope, that it shows up not where it's most expected, but where it is most needed. That's been true in my experience. When I talk to people who have been diagnosed with cancer, they rarely ever sound hopeless. They begin to talk about scheduling surgery and following up with some kind of radiation. They talk about some new experimental drug that's been having good results. And if their doctor tells them that their chances of survival are one in ten, they cling to that one so hopefully you would think the odds had been reversed, that it was 10 to 1 instead of the other way around. In fact, this is when I hear the word hope most often, not when everything is going well, but when things aren't going well at all. That's when people hold on to the slender thread of hope as if it were a rope that would keep them from going under. I was explaining this to my daughter on Friday, telling her how a jeweler will often show off a diamond by putting it against a black velvet cloth. The the hard brilliance of the diamond is contrasted by the, the soft, velvety backdrop. It seems that way with hope, that only in our darkest moments does hope really begin to shine. 